unfortunately, there are some more questions and comments on, on the floor, but we don't have uh, more time. So I, I guess uh, Malcolm will be happy to take them uh, during the coffee break. But uh, we have to move on. And uh, so Dominique Angioligio will uh, help us uh, choosing among these menu of antiplatelets, anticoagulants uh, for non-stay, which is a little bit of a mess, I guess. Well, thank you, Hector, and uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I uh, consider Spain my, my second home, and I uh, want to thank the organizers again for the, for the kind invite. Now, I know we're slightly behind uh, schedule, and everybody's eager for their coffee break, uh, but uh, hopefully I'll be able to entertain you over the next uh, 20 minutes and provide some practical information on uh, which is the uh, optimal uh, antithrombotic cocktail, let's put it this way, in your patients with uh, non estivation acute coronary syndromes. And we'll start off with a, a slide of pathophysiology. I think it's always important to understand the development of a clot. As we know, when we have plaque rupture, the two key elements, there's a cellular component and a plasmatic component, which lead to the generation of a thrombus. It's also important to keep in mind that there's an interplay between the two. So uh, platelet activation generates thrombin, and thrombin is the most important activator of platelets. So it's very important when we speak about antithrombotic management that we distinguish uh, antiplatelets from, uh, from anticoagulants. And here to summarize the different agents that are approved uh, for use in our ACS patients, we have antiplatelets, which include COX-1 inhibitors, the family of P2Y12 inhibitors, and the glycoprotein 2B3 inhibitors. And the approved anticoagulants include the anti-2s, and the anti-tens. Now, when you look at this slide, you can say, well, we can use different drugs in different combinations at different doses and at different time points. So it's clear that you can come up with at least 100 different cocktails in your clinical practice. And so the question here is, which is the best cocktail? So what I'm going to do over the next 20 minutes is to provide what's my, op my optimal cocktail. I'm not saying that this is the best antithrombotic cocktail. You may agree or disagree with some of my uh, uh, decision points, uh, but I do believe that I'll give you some uh, a rationale behind the choice of my cocktail and my clinical practice. So we'll start off with aspirin. It's not such a, an important topic in, in, in Europe where uh, most uh, clinicians use uh, low-dose aspirin, but it is in the United States, or there has been. Uh, we do now have an answer to this based on the current OASIS 7 trial clearly showing that using high-dose aspirin is not associated with any clinical benefit, uh, but an increased risk uh, for bleeding. And now this has been implemented in the guidelines to uh, consider a low-dose aspirin. And this leads us then to the next question, well, what about P2Y12 receptor antagonists? And just from a historical perspective, we know that ticlopidine is a first-generation tenopyridine. I would say an important drug because it has led us to understand that the ideal cocktail of antithrombotic agents in the stented patient is a combination of dual antiplatelet therapy, not using an anticoagulant. But we know some of the side effects of uh, ticlopidine and uh, uh, obviously the delayed time frame to achieve full antiplatelet effects, and this is the reason why you have these sad faces. And the solution to these problems is introduction of a second generation tenopyridine, which is clopidogrel. And we know a lot of the uh, favorable aspects by here, the happy faces associated with uh, this uh, uh, drug. Now, over the course of the past several years, we've also learned about uh, which is the best uh, dose of uh, clopidogrel. And I would say that there are a large number of studies clearly supporting uh, the use of high uh, loading doses of, of clopidogrel. This is now implemented in the guidelines. And uh, so our starting point here is, in my opinion, in the ACS patient and patients undergoing PCI, uh, there's no reason why not to give a clopidogrel 600 milligram loading dose together with aspirin and heparin. So the practical questions here, especially for this talk, is, well, with regards to the optimal antithrombotic cocktail, when do we consider 2B3 inhibitors? When do we consider bivalirudin? And when do we consider the new P2Y12 receptor antagonist? I think this is the main question. These are the different clinical scenarios. I've been asked to speak only about one, which is unstable angina non-STEMI. We'll focus on, on this cohort. So let's speak about 2B3 inhibitors, to be or not to be, okay? So uh, after 400 years of uh, William Shakespeare's death, we, I don't think we still have an answer. Hopefully I'll give you an answer in the next 20 minutes on the use of 2B3 inhibitors. Uh, 
And there's been a lot of confusion about the role of 2B3 inhibitors because we've been used to looking at a lot of the seminal trials performed in the mid-90s. But please keep in mind that these trials, as I say here, were performed in the good old days, was less experienced, not all with stents. Many of these were performed with first-generation tenopyridines, with teclopidine, or with low-dose clopidogrel. And uh, we, did, we only had indirect thrombin inhibitors. So let's look at the modern era of ACS, and let's look at the ISO-REACT trial. All patients pretreated with 600 milligrams of clopidogrel. And if you look at the trial, uh, the use of a 2B3 inhibitor in ACS patients was only positive in those with uh, uh, cardiac enzymes. And so we start to have an answer. The role of 2B3 inhibitors is not useful in ACS patients who are troponin negative. Problems with 2B3 2B2 inhibitors, bleeding. Do we have alternatives? The answer is yes. This is the data from the ACUITY trial. And clearly you can see that there are no differences. It's not inferior in terms of ischemic events, a significant reduction in bleeding, and therefore superior when we look at net clinical outcomes. Now, one of the points that came out from the ACUITY trial uh, was uh, the uh, positive interaction. We don't see too many positive interactions for uh, tenopyridine use. So we're dealing with an anticoagulant, and we want to substitute this for an antiplatelet. But you really can't do that. So there is a benefit with bivalirudin if these patients are pretreated with tenopyridine. And this is something that we learned from historical trials. This is a meta-analysis from Mark Sabatin, clearly showing that a pretreatment strategy with a P2Y12 inhibitor is the way to go. So the next question is, well, what about upstream 2B3 inhibitors? We've been doing it for so many years in our clinical practice, but it was not until just a few years ago that we had a dedicated randomized trial to address this question. Is there a benefit of a routine upstream treatment with a 2B3 inhibitor? These are the results from the early ACS trial and clearly showing that the answer is no. And this is the reason why both the European and uh, uh, American guidelines provide a class three recommendations against routine use of upstream 2B3 inhibitors. So, what is our main concern with regards to 2B3 inhibitors? We mentioned before bleeding. Now, why is bleeding important? Now, you see this is a very nice analysis coming from the ACUITY trial, and if you look at uh, patients with a, prior, with a bleed within the first 30 days in uh, green and those with an MI within the first 30 days in blue, you can see that the impact on mortality was e actually even higher in those patients with a major bleed. So it's something that we really need to pay attention to, and Dr. Bell already alluded to uh, different approaches. I'd like to add uh, to the putting emphasis on, on radio approaches, which is now uh, being more and more used even in uh, uh, interventional practices in the United States, but definitely also minimizing the use of uh, uh, 2B3 inhibitors. So uh, what's my antithrombotic cocktail? So our starting point was very simple. Everybody gets a load of aspirin, continue with uh, uh, low-dose maintenance, 600 milligram load of clopidogrel, continue with 75 milligram maintenance, and all of our patients get some form of indirect thrombin inhibitor. So uh, the uh, next question is, well, when do I use bivalirudin? Well, I use it in all my high-risk patient, high patients for bleeding, elderly, CKD, and diabetes, particularly if they're pretreated with clopidogrel, and if there's unclear uh, prior anticoagulation because it's safe to switch. Now, a very practical concern is how many times you have a patient, you're in the cat lab, and you ask the nurse, when was the patient got the last dose of anoxaparin? And the, patient, the nurse will say one thing. You ask the patient, the patient will say something else. It happens all over the place. I worked in three different countries, Italy, Spain, and the United States, and it happens systematically. So one of the advantages with bivalirudin that it is safe to switch, so you really don't have to think too much. So when they use a 2B3 inhibitor, well, if the patient's already on upstream 2B3 inhibitor, for example, if it's a transfer, if the patient's not pretreated with clopidogrel, especially if it's a high-risk thrombotic burden, and if it's a patient who comes in with an ACS already on dual antiplatelet therapy, because I think that patient's a different animal. If a patient has an event while on dual antiplatelet therapy, I think we really need to guarantee that that patient gets antiplatelet protection. Now, there's been a, a, a lot of hesitance in the uptake of, of bivalirudin, particularly in Europe, which may be related to the fact that uh, the acuity trial design was somewhat complex. So our German colleague said, well, let's try to make a, a design a simple trial where everybody gets a 600 milligram loading dose of clopidogrel, everybody's pretreated, and everybody gets the same 2B3 inhibitor. And this is data presented at the uh, last AHA published in New England. It was a trial designed for superiority of a 2B3 inhibitor over bivalirudin. As you can see, no differences in the net clinical outcome and the investigators said, let's, let's throw in the large MIs, not, let's put to the simple uh, troponin increases, and let's look at the major bleeding, not the acuity 
uh, the fine bleeding, where if your patient has a small hematoma, that's considered a bleed. So you see no differences between the two drugs, but definitely an increase in the bleeding with, uh, uh, with AB6MAB versus bivalirudin. So uh, the next question is, well, we, you've seen that uh, we're moving more towards less use of 2B3 inhibitors uh, and, and uh, more bivalirudin. Well, is there a role for the new P2Y12 receptor antagonist? Now, you see here in this cartoon, I'm not going to go into too many details, uh, the mechanism of action of both prasugrel and ticagrelor. Uh, Prasugrel is a third-generation tenopyridine, a more favorable uh, pharmacokinetics, which therefore translates into better pharmacodynamics and block irreversibly the P2Y12 receptor. Ticagrelor is a, a, a first-in-class CPTP, so it's a direct acting uh, on the P2Y12 receptor. Now, uh, we have uh, two large-scale clinical trials to uh, test the superiority of each one of these agents over clopidogrel in high-risk ACS patients. Not going to go into too many of the details, but you can see that uh, both trials met their primary endpoint, showing superiority over clopidogrel with long-term uh, treatment of each one of these drugs. But each one of these trials also showed that there was a price to pay, which was bleeding. Okay? It happened with both drugs. There's no free lunch. Higher antiplatelet effects, reduction in ischemic events, also higher risk of bleeding. Now, there's been a lot of confusion with regards to uh, uh, ticagrelor when you're looking at the overall bleeding. And I think it's a lot related to the definitions in the trial because uh, these included patients who also underwent surgery. So when you look at the data, see the vast majority of bleeding were driven by the cabbage bleeding. But when you look at the non-cabbage bleeding, in other words, the patient who you bring to the cat lab and you put a stent in that patient and you're going to put that patient on a new drug, this is information that you do need to provide. Okay, there's a similar increased risk of bleeding, uh, just like with, um, with Prasugal. You can see here the number of neighbor to harm is uh, virtually identical. So the, uh, it's important also to keep in mind that the differences in trial designs, okay, first of all, the patient population, uh, Triton was a PCI trial, uh, Plato was a full spectrum of ACS. Uh, in uh, Triton, pretreatment was not allowed except in STEMI. It was allowed in Plato. Differences in loading dose, it was 300 milligrams in Triton, up to 600 milligrams in Plato, and the duration of the trial, almost 15 months in Triton and nine months in, in Plato. I think it's important also for interpreting the bleeding data. So the question here, is there a winner between the two? And the answer is no. I think they're both winners because both trials met their primary endpoint and they showed superiority of each drug versus clopidogrel. So, if you look at the DSC guidelines, and I think DSC guidelines are better than American guidelines uh, because uh, they uh, provide a class 1B recommendations for the two new drugs for Prasugrel and uh, Ticagrelor. Uh, and uh, uh, the US guidelines instead put a 1B for all three. So it doesn't, allow, doesn't help us too much in our clinical practice. And they provide something which is very interesting in my opinion, which is a novel way of putting things. A 1A for clopidogrel for patients who cannot receive ticagrelor or prasugrel. So if we look into our clinical practice, I think as we move forward with introducing these new agents, I think we need to understand who are the patients where we cannot use uh, uh, prasugrel or ticagrelor. So what are the contraindications and the precautions? Contraindications, patients at high risk of bleeding, patients with prior TR stroke or prasugrel, and precautions in the elderly, the low weights, and patients undergoing surgery need to wait seven days. With ticagrelor, high risk of bleeding is also a contraindication in prior hemorrhagic strokes. So you can consider in patients with prior ischemic uh, cerebral vascular events, but not uh, hemorrhagic uh, stroke. There are a series of precautions. I'm not going to go through all of these. These are within the European label. You should be aware uh, of the, especially of the bradycardia and the dyspnea. I would say the most important, in my opinion, is compliance because this is a twice daily uh, uh, drug. So uh, what do I do in my practice? And again, I want you to keep this in mind because uh, this is when do I use Prasugrel. You see there's a common denominator here. All these are patients at high risk for thrombotic events. Patients with gone undergoing primary PCI, diabetics, recurrent ACS while in clopidogrel and stent thrombosis. I'm not going to speak about uh, uh, STEMI because it's not part of this talk. Um, but I'm going to speak briefly on why I use a specific drug in specific scenarios. Now, uh, patients with diabetes. You see this is a slide which summarizes the three major uh, cl uh, clinical trials with new treatment strategies, uh, Prasugrel and Triton, Tricagrelor and Plato, and high-dose clopidogrel and Oasis 7. Now I understand that it's correct, it's not correct to uh, make comparisons across trials this way, but we need to make decisions. 
And I think that we need to look at the niche of each individual agent. And if you look at the Triton Timeter A trial in patients with diabetes, clearly uh, there's uh, some advantage in this uh, patient uh, cohort. And this is the reason why I choose uh, a prasugal in my patients with diabetes. And you can see here the uh, outcomes in the trial, the Kaplan-Meier curves, and no differences in major bleeding between the two, co the two cohorts. What about recurrent ACS while on clopidogrel? I think there's a very nice analysis coming from the Triton trial, uh, looking at those patients who survived their first event because if they died, they couldn't go on and having a second event. <laughs> and you can see that here that's the significant differences between the two arms uh, in favor of prasugrel, but there's also a benefit in terms of mortality. So definitely if you have a patient coming in with an event while on clopidogrel, you need to switch uh, uh, treatment. And the third, uh, the, the next option is, well, uh, a question that comes up a lot, well, what do you do in your clinical practice if you want to switch treatment? This is analysis from the, sw uh, from the swap trial. And just to make things simple, I uh, switch automatically using a loading dose. I always use the term go big or go home. Just give a 60 milligram uh, uh, loading dose. And the last point is uh, stent thrombosis. And again, uh, here you see a, a similar analysis comparing the three uh, studies. And I think that uh, perhaps we've got something to gain for patients uh, in terms of reduction of stent thrombosis. Now, uh, you see here at the bottom of the slide, there's some common factors. All these patients have high thrombotic risk. The benefits strongly outweigh the, uh, the, uh, the risk because there were no differences or minimal differences in bleeding. And all these, in all these settings, are shown to be cost effective. So when do I use uh, Ticagrelor? Well, you see, I put the same four settings, okay? But I consider Ticagrelor if a patient had a prior uh, cerebrovascular event and had one of these uh, four situations. Another scenario is the high-risk medically managed ACS where I cannot use Prasugrel. And patients with clopidogrel allergy, as happens in our practice, there's been some anecdotal data of switching to Prasugrel. I said, well, this is like antibiotics, just switch to class. Here you some, see some new data looking at patients with prior to stroke, I think remarkable data, looking at showing almost a 40% relative risk reduction in cerebrovascular events using Ticagrelor in the uh, uh, PLATO trial. So very encouraging data, which we did not see in, uh, in, in the Triton trial. And with regards to the medically managed, I think that this was a major driver of the mortality benefit in the trial. Uh, sometimes we forget that the medically managed patients are typically the highest risk patients. And you see here, there was a 25% relative risk reduction in the medically managed patient within the trial. And I think that this is the reason why Ticagrelor should be preferred. And similar to Prasugrel, well, when I want to switch a treatment, what do I do? Uh, well, again, I just give a, a load of 180 milligram. We don't have clinical data, but we do have very nice uh, pharmacodynamic data. Now, there's been a lot of questions of, regarding what to do in the, the more vulnerable patients, such as the elderly and, and the low weights. And I'm going to put here a, a series of facts, which I think are important for our clinical practice. Now, uh, both populations have shown to be associated with a high risk of bleeding. This is irrespective of, of management, with pitagol, prasugrel, ticagrelor. And uh, the ble bleeding risk is further increased, um, as mentioned before, with prasugrel and ticagrelor. And we have very limited data, for example, if we want to modify doses, which has been suggested, for example, with, with prasugrel. And the bottom line truth is that we have very good experience with clopidogrel in these patients. So what do I do in my practice in the, these more vulnerable patients? Well, I continue to use clopidogrel. I do not use the newer agents unless the patient comes in with a recurrent event. In these specific cases, I choose ticagrelor because we did not have any of those safety signals that we saw with, uh, uh, with prasugrel. Here you see a, a, a treatment algorithm which somewhat summarizes what I just mentioned. Uh, when you have your unstable angina non-STEMI patient, I uh, prefer to pretreat all my patients. Now, uh, in, the, uh, in the Triton trial, patients could not be pretreated with, uh, with Prasugrel. However, the FDA uh, said, well, if you want to pretreat your patients with Prasugrel, you can, even though this is not consistent with the guidelines, because the vast majority of patients uh, do undergo an invasive strategy and may undergo PCI. If the patients are not pretreated, definitely need to be treated within one hour of uh, uh, leaving the, uh, uh, the cat lab. And obviously, you need to be informed about uh, the, uh, uh, the contraindications. And also keep in mind that for both Prasugrel and Ticagrelor, you need to wait uh, five to seven days. Seven days for Prasugrel, five to seven for Ticagrelor if patients do need to go to surgery. Now, I gave you uh, some insights on a series of, uh, uh, of cocktails. And uh, what's not good for me may be good for others. It's all a matter of taste, just like any cocktails. So I want to at least acknowledge uh, anoxaparin, high-maintenance clopidogrel, and fondaparinox. Now, anoxaparin 
in, in my practice is not that uh, useful. I do most of my cases radial where I give 3,000 units of, 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 of heparin through the radial sheet. I do not know what to do with the noxaparin. I just don't know what to do. So if they come on an exoparin, I typically switch to bivalirudin. High maintenance dose clopidogrel, ACE 7. In my opinion, it was a negative trial. The primary endpoint was not met, and we have better agents. Found the paranox. Well, if you look at the ACEs trial, great. You have a reduction in bleeding, but then we know that we need to integrate using full-dose um, fractionated heparin, as we learned from OASIS-8, to reduce uh, catheter-induced uh, uh, thrombosis. So I really don't see that too useful in uh, my, uh, uh, my practice. Other relevant topics, this is a very broad topic. I uh, just want to at least acknowledge these are some points for discussion, which you're going to hear about uh, during this meeting. What's the optimal duration of dual antiplatelet therapy and ongoing process? Should we be treating the patient? Should we be treating the stent? What's the optimal antiplatelet therapy in patients requiring oral anticoagulation? I work in Florida. We have a lot of elderly patients in AFib. What do you do with regards to triple uh, uh, therapy? How about bridging your uh, patients treated with zest to, to surgery? And another unopened topic is the role of platelet function in genetic testing, and there'll be a dedicated session uh, uh, tomorrow morning. Now, if you thought that the, this presentation and the combination and the cocktails that Penn uses is somewhat confusing, let's have this talk again in 10 years. Reason. There are many, many other antithrombotic agents which are currently under development. You can see the slide uh, uh, summarizes uh, 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 many of them, just looking at the antiplatelets, but we also have a series of anticoagulants. If we're looking into the future, uh, some of the drugs that are really around the corner but still not clinically approved, we have alinegrel, although this has stopped uh, its, uh, at its phase two investigation, Cangrelor, which is now in phase three investigation, and Vorapaxar, which we know has now completed its phase three clinical trials. We'll see if this will ever be approved. In the field of anticoagulants, we have automixaban and uh, riroxaban, and riroxaban is up to be discussed with the FDA uh, uh, this, uh, this month. So uh, ultimately, uh, what we're dealing here with is balancing the, the safety and efficacy in our patients uh, uh, with, uh, with ACS. And an evolving topic is uh, finding what we call the sweet spot of level of platelet inhibition, one that is not uh, too high to prevent patients from having bleeding, and one that is not too low for, for preventing patients from having recurrent ischemic events. And definitely as we move forward and we have a variety of cocktails, we can integrate a lot of this information uh, based on a uh, patient's background. For example, the patient presents with an ACS, the patient has diabetes, CKD, integrating a platelet function and, uh, and genetic testing. Now, this all sounds wonderful and fancy, but we need to deal with another huge problem, in my opinion, which is cost. Who's going to pay for this? Okay? And I think that ultimately, uh, insurance companies and socialized systems will actually be dictating what the cocktail that we're allowed to be using in our clinical practice. And uh, ultimately, I would like to uh, conclude. Uh, we spoke a lot about uh, uh, cocktails uh, during this presentation, but uh, I essentially fooled you uh, because I do not love cocktails. Uh, I love uh, simple drinks, and I had the pleasure uh, last night of, uh, of understanding the, the culture of Sidra. You can see Sidra, and you see how uh, from something very simple uh, as an apple, uh, you can have a uh, a very uh, complex way of, of, of pouring and, and, and drinking. And I, I do uh, uh, look forward to uh, uh, enjoying more, more Sidra over the next few days at this meeting. And thank you very much for this invite. Thank you very much, uh, Dominic. Uh, are there any questions or comments? So, so I have a question. Um, I guess you, you actually showed your preferences, which are, in a way, and I think Malcolm pointed out that actually are related to your invasive strategy. I think it's completely different whether you are in the, maybe in the U.S., whether you are going to send your patient to the cat lab the day is admitted or, at, at, or, or maybe the day, before, the day uh, after. But uh, it may not be the same, for instance, in many places in Europe, particularly in the uh, second or primary hospitals in which they may have to wait for two, three days, and then the, the treatment is not the same. Would you make a difference whether you are, let's say, in an, uh, 
a quickly invasive environment yeah. or you're in a more conservative environment? Yeah, uh, uh, definitely. If you need to do the, always the best for what's your practice. And I uh, sh uh, outlined uh, what would be the optimal cocktail in a, in a more invasive environment. But if we were to translate to a more conservative environment, uh, I still think that the concept of uh, pre-treating our patients with dual uh, therapy is, is the way to go because you can say, well, if you give a, a, a 2 p inhibitor, you're prolonging infusion, increasing the risk of bleeding. And so uh, maybe I would go with a, a more potent, for, exa uh, for example, Ticagrelor, uh, which at the end of the day is shown to be beneficial whether you go invasive or medically managed. And, and I think that you're covering yourself in terms of antiplatelet treatment. And then once you get to the cat lab, you make your decision on what you want to do, if you want to maintain the patient on ticagrelor or switch to prasugrel or put the patient on clopidogrel. So I still think that the, the, the bottom line concepts remain the same, um, that having uh, aspirin and a P2Y12 inhibitor upstream is, is, is pivotal and try to stay away from the 2B2 inhibitors unless you believe that patient may somewhat benefit. But if the patient is really high risk, you're going to transfer that patient to a, a tertiary facility and get a hard cat as soon as possible. I, Tommy, I, I'm interested in knowing whether in the stage you have any cost con constraints uh, for uh, in insurance to pay for uh, prasugrel anti or because this is one of the main issues at the moment in this country. The, the short answer is yes, we, 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 we do, and, and uh, 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 what happens most of the times, you know, we'll discharge the patient on one of the newer agents and we'll get the phone call after, typically after a month uh, from, from the insurance companies. When I say after a month, because when, when we send the patients home, they all have a one month voucher for free drugs, and so nobody cares, but at one month you'll get the phone call many times and say, is this uh, medically necessary? And I think it's gonna be bigger of an issue uh, once we have a generic lipidogrel in the United States, which will be on May 16th, uh, and which we already have in here. So it's going to be, it's going to be a challenge, um, uh, but I, I, I think that there are certain situations where we've overcome. We're having less problems with Prasugrel because it's been on the market for a longer period of time than, than Ticagrelor. Right now in the United States at a discount pharmacy, you can get uh, warfarin for four dollars a month, and uh, the bigger tran is two hundred and forty dollars a month. So the cost-effective analyses say the bigger tran is cost-effective because you don't have to throw in the cost of the thrombophilia testing and the INR testing. All my patients say, I don't care about the cost of that because insurance pays for it. I care about paying four dollars versus two hundred and forty. And so I think there are advantages to the new anticoagulants, no question. But are they 60 times better? Because they are 60 times more expensive. So I think this is something we're going to have to work through over the next year or two. Okay. This was the, the last uh, question. This, uh, thank you very much to all the speakers for uh, the beautiful presentation at the audience.